morning, Gerald. Morning, Sue. Really nice to really nice to see some familiar faces here. Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the um, to the Skills Forum. Um, we have an excellent panel um, this morning who have got a whole host of experience to share with you today. Um, and I would really like to um, to ask them to introduce themselves very briefly, and and then I will do a little introduction of myself. My name's uh, my name's Jill Rindle. I'll tell you a little bit more about my background after I've uh, introduced our panelists. So, uh, shall we start? Um, shall we start with Steve? Steve, do you want to just introduce yourself a little? Absolutely, yes. Thank you, Jill. So, yeah, so I, I'm Steve. I run a company called The Job Guru. We um, provide recruitment services for SMEs um, around the three counties, mainly. Um, I've been working in recruitment for uh, for quite a number of years now. Um, started off um, with uh, defence and government and have moved into sort of more of the commercial side of, of business. Um, so I work with a lot of, um, get a lot of employers who tell me what they're looking for, get a lot of candidates who tell me what skills they have and what they're looking to do, and somehow try and marry the two disconnects together to get a perfect match. So um, I'm hoping that, uh, yeah, I can bring some of those conversations to, uh, to, to bear in, in this um, this forum and, and sort of impart some of that uh, experience. Thanks very much, Steve. I think uh, there'll be some really useful things that you can share with us this morning. Um, Peter, would you would you like to just uh, ex explain um, what you're doing with the Growth Hub and a little bit more about your background? Absolutely. Yeah. Morning, Jill. I'm uh, I've got a commercial uh, manufacturing background. Spent the bulk of my career in the private sector manufacturing both consumer and, and industrial products across a whole range of, of, of categories and been involved in a lot of overseas development, business transition, working with both the independent multinational stakeholders and also an interesting few years under working with private equity. Uh, today I'm now one of the growth hub, uh, high growth uh, business consultants. Obviously we're mentoring and supporting, providing strategic support to companies at, at relevant stages. I tend to work with the high growth uh, companies with two other colleagues, one with an ex-bank manager and one a professional marketing uh, trainer. So between the three of us, hopefully we add a lot of value to the, uh, the growth and development of our clients. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, and we also have with us this morning um, JP Corey, uh, who has a whole wealth of experience in, uh, in sort of large business, as, uh, as well as more recently setting up a, a, a small sort of de um, leadership development business. JP, would you like to um, give a little bit more on that? Thank you, Jill. Yeah, I guess uh, I've spent 30 years in general management type roles, um, building businesses globally for um, a couple of blue chip organizations. Um, I stepped out of that um, and become COO of a rapid growth software automation business. Um, and, and the main thing I've learned, I think, out of all of those experiences is that while it takes um, money and technology, to, to grow these sorts of businesses. Actually, the fundamental thing that's required is in what makes organizations tick is, is the people. Um, so for the last three years, um, I've stepped out on my own to help organizations focus on this topic um, based on what I've learned and, and what I continue to learn. So really, I'm looking to energize um, teams, organizations, boards, people to help them succeed together. Uh, and as part of my in involvement with Gloucestershire, um, I work with the LEP where I'm on the steering committee group for uh, the mentor scheme, which is um, going to be important for this recovery piece. Thank you. Thank you very much. Some re really great experience there across, across several sectors, which will be fantastic. Um, Simon, we caught up a little bit um, this morning and uh, Simon uh, is, uh, is an accountant and runs an accountancy firm. Uh, and uh, would you like to share a little bit about your experience, Simon? Yes, yeah, thanks, Jill, and yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Simon Sheldon. I uh, run a, an accountancy practice uh, called Harper Sheldon, based on Stabberton Technology Park. 
Uh, I've been running that now for 18 years. Uh, prior to that, I worked and trained with um, Crow, as they are known now, uh, also based in Cheltenham. So I've been in the Gloucestershire uh, business community for probably far too long. Um, um, but in addition, I mean, as well as being responsible for recruiting uh, at our business, because we're now up to, what, 20 employees, um, I also chair Whitehorse Accountancy Training, which is um, a CPD and um, a AAT uh, training organisation based down in Bath. And they provide a lot of training for the local accountancy firms, you know, such as Randall and Payne, Monaghan, Morris Owen. So, um, so you know, I sort of see the, the, the recruitment and, and sort of training um, landscape uh, from that perspective. And in addition, outside of that, I sit on the Banking and Finance Committee of the, of the LEP, uh, and I'm involved in a couple of, uh, couple of local charities, including Cheltenham Film Festival, which is screening this week. Just give a quick plug. Thank you. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. And, uh, and last but not at all least, um, we, have, we have Lindsay, who has a wealth of experience um, in careers advice. Um, Lindsay, would you like to give a little um, overview of your experience? Yes, yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm, my background is um, careers advice and guidance, and um, I have worked in the county for quite a few years as part of the county career service, um, working in schools and colleges. Um, but in 2011, I took voluntary redundancy when the provision of careers guidance sort of changed um, in the way it was delivered so that schools were responsible for that and the county service became a more intensive support service for young people with complex um, issues to address. Um, it was quite a scary time but actually it was very good for me as um, a careers advisor and just generally as a person because I had to take my own advice and address my own employability and really have a rethink about where, how I wanted to go forward, um, the skills I wanted to use, the skills I wanted to develop, um, and how maybe I could use my background in different ways. Um, so the consequence of that has been that I've continued to work in careers guidance. I've done some work within higher education at UE in Bristol. Um, I've also worked with the long-term unemployed and people facing barriers to employment. Um, but I've worked in some different areas as well, which I have really enjoyed including um, being a wedding registrar and working in the museum and tourism sector. Um, so I've been able to use my background in different ways. Uh, most currently, um, my sort of focus is um, working with people to support them in recognising their skills and experience, how to confidently talk about them and write about them, and how to be a proactive career manager and to kind of take charge of their own employability. I think that's um, really helpful and particularly um, you know one of the topics we'll discuss this morning is is, is how we're responding to the particular um, set of circumstances that everybody's finding themselves in now with the, with, with the Covid situation and, and you know how people can take control of that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my you know my own experience I, I have a, um, a sort of long um, commercial business background and then then spent the last 10 years in higher education um, with particular responsibility for employability and industry partnerships. So I did a lot of work in, uh, in working between um, education and, uh, and employers and, and finding ways to um, sort of develop meaningful um, opportunities and curriculum to support students um, and young people that uh, that would be going into the workplace and uh, very passionate about it um, as people that know me well know um, and uh, I've spent um, the last year really working um, working in international education and taking that same agenda um, into that sphere and so was you know very pleased to be asked to um, you know to chair this panel this morning and to spend some time talking with uh, with a range of a range of experts in their in their field about something that I'm very passionate about, um, so I, I thought it would be really great to to try and um, sort of kick off a little bit uh, about the um, you know the sort of the challenges that are facing Gloucestershire and the opportunities that are facing Gloucestershire 
in terms of um, you know the, the the skills that are needed um, to really sort of drive um, drive the county forward. Um, the you know the, the LEP have been putting together their local industrial strategy and looking at the kind of skills that are required to uh, you know to drive that strategy forward. And we have some fantastic opportunities in the county. You know, in particular with uh, you know, sort of manufacturing, advanced engineering companies. We have uh, you know we have agrotech really uh, really amazing um, opportunities in agrotech. And of course, our cyber tech um, <coughs> opportunities as well. And I know, um, you know, from the intros that people have given this morning, there is a wealth of experience in some of those in some of those sectors or supporting some of those sectors. So, you know, I, I just wondered what the panel felt uh, about, you know, the, the, the skills opportunities there are to support that agenda in Gloucestershire at the moment and where those gaps may lie. Who would who would like who would like to start? I've got no I've got no hands up at the moment. <laughs> on, I'll, I'll, I'll throw my hat in the ring. <laughs> go go then uh, go, Simon. <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, you know, we're, we're based out at Staverton, and I mean, we're sort of surrounded by businesses that are focused on the aviation industry, and and you have to say that 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 sector is a big concern, I think, for Gloucestershire. Um, you know, there's massive. Um, reductions in aviation activity and and i think that will have a big impact but nonetheless you know there's a lot of skilled individuals within those businesses and and i think you know probably looking ahead it's all going to be about how you adapt as a business and um and as you pointed out correctly you know uh, you know almost across the road we're going to have this you know massive cyber park uh, emerging and so i think we're we're possibly going to see a bit of a, a shift of, of where you know where the industry's you know focus will be in Gloucestershire you know maybe a maybe a, a reduction perhaps in the aviation sector but an increase in in you know, obviously the cyber activities but as you've already pointed out yeah you know Ag agritech I mean you know farm 491 out at Sirencester you know there is a lot of uh, you know a lot of you know exciting you know things going on there and you know I've got clients working in that sector and I, and I think, you know, I think Gloucestershire is a great county that, you know, does have a, a habit of adapting and, and probably bucking the trend. So, yeah, I think we're going to have a difficult few months, but I'm, I'm quite, quite positive uh, for, you know, sort of the future of Gloucestershire. That, that, that's, that's really great to hear. Um, has, has anybody else got any, uh, any views on, uh, on the, the... So, Jill... Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think... Simon is is quite correct with that. I th you know, there's a, there's a lot of sort of cliches that are evolving out of um, the current circumstances around, um, you know, getting back to normal or going forward to a new normal or there will be no normal. Um, what 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 the current circumstances has shown us, and I think what you, what a lot of people are probably surprised by is they say it's very difficult for people to change, particularly if they're ingrained in their ways. And I guess probably, you know, in a planet full of billions of people, billions of people have fundamentally changed over three months. Mm. So I think one of the key sort of learning and development things that comes out of all of this is our ability to, when we have a compelling need, to move into new ways of living our lives and actually pretty quickly get used to it and accommodate it. Not, not everybody, but, but the vast majority. So I think that's a, a really interesting um, takeaway from COVID is just how change ready human beings can be when they need to change, necessity being the mother of invention and all of those sorts of uh, type statements. What I think, um, on this topic for Gloucestershire, and, and, and I, I think and care about it a lot, is historically we've actually had quite a big brain drain every morning out of the county into other counties uh, and into other countries. I myself used to commute to Zurich from here. Um, so um, I think one of the things with remote working is it's actually showing Gloucestershire has got a lot of benefits in terms of actually being a good place to work, but actually a, a place that it's possible to spend a working day in. So that's another big takeaway from, from the COVID activity. 
bringing it into more specific sort of job kind of uh, aspects is I think, you know, when we look at where the world is going, I think it's a very challenging time for, for young people. And it's interesting today that um, Dame Carolyn Fairbank has written to the Prime Minister as one of her last acts as uh, uh, Director General of the CBI to highlight um, three areas call for action for the government. And, and number one on that list is making job creation, skills training and opportunities, especially for young people, the top priority, closely followed by uh, investing in the green economy. Uh, to create new jobs, to um, raise investment and, and build a sustainable future. So for me, I think Gloucestershire has got a great natural resource of talent. And I think it's recognised outside of the county. And I think we've got an opportunity to leapfrog um, a lot of people who are working sort of retrograde, defend the old normal. So what I think is we've got a great opportunity to mobilise. If you take aviation, I think, um, you know, there's some really powerful things that will evolve out of the um, uh, Western Gateway Initiative, uh, I, I believe. And I think probably we need to make a technology leap. We need to be looking at something like hydrogen as a fuel source for aviation, uh, uh, rather than keeping iterating on you know, either conventional technologies or battery technologies, which are too heavy and also come out of cobalt, out of the ground, so it's just taken another resource. So, you know, it's a huge topic, but I guess my main point, Jill, would be is it's a time for um, talent and skills to um, look after our young people, because I think they can reverse mentor some of us dinosaurs as well. But I think um, preparing ourselves for a step change in... Um, step change in technology and thinking and how we go about business. You, you, you can't do business the way we've done before. You can't treat people the way we've done before. You can't manage people the way you've run before. We need to lead. So leadership is going to be about step changes, I think. I think there's some really fantastic points there. Um, and I, I'd very much like to, uh, like to concur with, um, with this as an opportunity um, because um, for those for those of you that that haven't had a look at the um, the, the local industrial strategy draft that is um, been put forward um, via the LEP, it, it is available on their on their website. But many many of these um, uh, of these areas have actually been recognised in terms of the drain the drain of young people out of Gloucestershire, um, the very you know the the high importance that young people are placing on. Uh, on the um, the environment and uh, and the way um, that we live and work, the uh, the opportunities that there are in Gloucestershire to live a good life because of the uh, because of the fantastic environment and the culture that we have around us, um, and uh, and the innovation that is coming out of um, businesses in Gloucestershire. So that you know that very much concurs with all of the thoughts that JP has just put together, and uh, and the opportunity that we have with them with potentially being able to work differently um, and and people's change of mind as to how that might occur may actually help to keep people not moving out of Gloucestershire and um, I think the, the the other point there is is looking at um, you know the education side and the joining of education education in Gloucestershire is, is being placed very much at the heart in terms of the joining up the kind of skills, courses, et cetera, um, that are going to feed the opportunities for the future. And that, that's very much in that strategic thought. Um, so, so yes, I'm going to bring in, uh, I'm just going to, going to bring in Steve at this point, because Steve, you're working in recruitment. And I, and I just wonder whether, you know, what, what you're seeing in terms of the sort of aspirations of people coming, um, you know, coming into the, um, into the pipeline and then, and how that fits with what the um, what the businesses are requiring at this stage? Yeah, so thanks for for bringing me in there, Jill. Um, and it, it, it's it's a very interesting time actually in recruitment because we've had um, um, a, a very rapid change in the market, very sudden. Um, a couple of months ago, there were lots and lots of vacancies. 
hardly any people available to fill those vacancies. Um, and it was just, a, a, you know, it was a bit of a, um, a bum fight for companies trying to work out how to attract the best people, how to attract anyone, let alone the best people. Um, and then all of a sudden, they stopped recruiting and there are more people coming available. It looks like there's going to be a lot more, you know, unfortunately, redundancies possibly in the pipeline and more people coming available to change jobs. And companies are still, um, I'm seeing a lot of nervousness in the market. Companies are still hiring. The vacancies are still there, but they're a little bit reticent on moving quickly. Um, so, so it's a really interesting time for that at the moment. And I think it will change very rapidly again. I think that as soon as there's a bit more confidence in the market and going back to what Simon said about uh, Gloucestershire being very focused on, um, or there's a lot of uh, aviation um, businesses in, in Gloucestershire and they're, you know, talking to them, they've got a lot of um, business at the moment, but they're looking at the forward pipeline and thinking what's going to happen there. And as JP says, that's, I think, driving innovation. Companies are now looking at being innovative. And what's that bringing into what companies I'm talking to when they're looking at people coming to join them is they're looking for people to come and join them with new ideas, even coming from the younger, the graduate sector. They're looking at how they can help their business evolve and move forward. There, there is that, um, I'm getting that change that um, companies are realizing they can't necessarily keep doing the same thing they've been doing on and on. They need to be more flexible and they need to, and they need people to come in and join them who, as I say, are going to bring those new skills, but are also going to be flexible in, in their attitudes, not coming across, not coming to say, I've learned to do things this way and this is the only way that I know how to do it. And, and I only want to work for a company that has 100% green credentials now, need to be flexible to say, I want to work with a company that has ambition. To has that. So, so, so there's both sides, I think, uh, uh, having a, a flexibility to really, um, as I say, create this, this change. Um, I think JP mentioned um, remote working uh, as coming in. And, you know, I've got a client who absolutely was adamant that there is no possible way on earth that any member of staff could work remotely in their business. It was impossible. Just the way the business worked couldn't happen. Now every single member of staff is working remotely and he's now promoting remote working on places like the link LinkedIn saying how, how great it is for the business, how much more um, dynamic their business is now with, um, with being able to recruit people. Um, you know, he's based in South Gloucestershire, but he can get people who are based in, in Cheltenham not needing to commute and he can get the skills, the technical skills of people in Cheltenham who would not, possibly would have said I don't want to travel to the countryside I want to stay you know in the more urban areas um so yeah so, so I think it's um it's a really interesting time and I think that um the the issue that I'm seeing from people who are looking for jobs is they're struggling to get across what their skills actually are and that's the um that's the issue. That's when I'm talking to people looking for jobs. The main focus I have to do, we understand what that, you know, they understand what they're looking for on, on most occasions, but they don't understand how to get that across. And employers don't understand how to get across what they need. So it's trying to get those that's, conversations that, happening properly. That's a really, a really interesting point, and uh, uh, and I something I, I will come back to because I've got um, I, I've got a little bit of um, a little bit of data from the student um, Institute of Student Employers that talk about sort of um, modes of recruitment. So I'm, I'm going I'll hold that one for a little while until uh, until we've explored this this particular line of questioning, and then we can we can come back to that. But I I notice I've got um, both Lindsay and and Peter who would like who'd like to have something to say. So Lindsay. Um, can I uh, can I ask for your thoughts, please? Yes, um, it's been really interesting to hear what's been said so far, and um, coming sort of from um, where I do in terms of working with individuals, um, I certainly think the sort of flexibility and the resilience that's been shown 
um, by businesses and um, industries, you know, niche, knowing that they need to show that sort of flexibility, innovation and resilience is what um, I think JP was saying that, you know, people are showing as well. And I think that resilience and that um, ability to respond to change is is absolutely you know what um people do need to go forward you know and, and that's the core of, of someone's employability really um and certainly this last three months has put that into sharp focus and i have got um some questions that i am going to reflect on myself for my own employability but just out of interest i thought i would um just throw some of them out there because I think they're really important things for everyone to think about and certainly people who are looking yeah. for a career change who need to look for a career change people are looking you know job seekers generally but people who are re-evaluating where they're at um, and you know one of the questions is about certainty versus uncertainty and it's about you know that ability to reflect and one of the things is um, you know how how have you adapted to uncertainty yourself um have you found it constricting or liberating and what do you know about your ability to manage change now that you didn't know three months ago so it's it's kind of having that kind of thought it's about the opportunity so what have you taken the opportunity to do have you volunteered um have you done something online that you wouldn't have done before some cpd online how have you used you know that this as an opportunity um so how how are you maybe going to look at your learning in future inspiration who has inspired you in the last three months it could be someone in the in the you know public eye could be someone that you know locally and why and then you know sort of what, what does that mean for sort of where you're at and how you might then um look at where you want to get to but look at the things you know the opportunities that have presented themselves through a very very difficult situation so that that was one thing the other thing i wanted to mention was about um the young about young people and certainly that you know is, is presenting a big challenge and i just wanted to say something about what the Career Development Institute um, has been doing. That's a professional um, in organisation for careers gu guidance, careers advisors and careers educators. And they are um, sort of lobbying for a um, investment and a, a, a task force that will look at careers guidance opportunities for young people. And I, I, you know, to link with what JP was saying about the opportunities that need to be there for young people, it's also really important that the guidance is there to support them in making the right decisions because there's a cost to the individual and to the economy if people are um, going into things that they then you know don't stick with don't suit them so there's that that's that's happening at the moment to support you know a call for um, guidance to be available to adults as well and to support people in this rethink but also supporting people in um, being able to talk and write confidently about what they have to offer once they're able to kind of have that self-awareness. Um, so that's, that's um, what I wanted to kind of uh, add to the discussion. Really, really useful. And, and actually that, that, that ability to be able to get the message across, um, you know, really, um, really sort of concurs with what Steve had to say um, about that as well. So, uh, uh, and uh, and you know would would absolutely um, be aligned with my experiences of uh, uh, of young people not really being able to you know articulate well enough um, you know their experiences and skill set um, you know when when needing to do so. Um, so I'd, I'd really Jill, like to Jill, just sorry very quickly. Steve made a point at the end of what he was saying mm -hmm. about companies. Um, being able to uh, articulate what they want from mm -hmm. the, the workplace, but mm -hmm. actually probably really in reality struggling with the needs. To Lindsay's point, you know, what a tough situation for young people to try and navigate their, through, their way through imprecise language to actually present themselves in a meaningful way to meet those needs when, yes. be, when you know, the established organizations that are looking to hire can articulate what they really want. Yeah. So it's, no, uh, it's, it's very got, tough on the young people. 
very yes very very yeah. tough and uh, and i think somebody mentioned sort of mentoring opportunities and i and i think uh, and mentoring both ways around is it uh, is something of great value um peter you've done a bit of mentoring of sorts <laughs> what um, what have what, what have you got to add to to this conversation Absolutely. Well, I mean, that's that's been our, our day job, certainly over the last few months, uh, uh, very much so at, at all levels, because obviously the university, we have the start and grow team who are in place for literally to help um, young people, young students, young startups, young entrepreneurs. And I'm sure there'll be a lot more to come as we proceed through the uh, through the period. And equally, our, our Growth Hub network, clearly we've got the four uh, physical sites uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, hopefully in the near future, but on a remote basis now, all the teams have been supporting uh, businesses with our, our, our strategic webinars, as well as obviously key discussions around financial support, both with the, uh, with the uh, relevant um, COVID programs in, in place. But I think what's interesting, I think moving forward is clearly, you know, the, the industrial strategy and GFIRST, who we work closely with, clearly it's all about creating this magnet for jobs within Gloucestershire and enticing young people to not only remain in the county but also come to the county because clearly as Steve talked about earlier on you know the investment in cyber and cyber central and data the agri-tech you know we've got some very world-class leading uh, development centers like Camden BRI and the food and mm -hmm. beverage sector we've got a lot of smart businesses within the county it's clearly I think for a number of businesses, as they put their foot, the foot on the ball for five minutes and just recalibrate where they are in the current climate, clearly the one thing I learned in business, you, you know, you can cost cut your way into profitability, but you can't cost cut your way into prosperity. So eventually you're going to have to invest not only in people, but in innovation and, and marketing to really recover your business and grow the business. So I think the prospects are, are good. We've been speaking directly in the last few weeks to businesses, engineering companies actually, who want to relocate into Gloucestershire, get close to their supply chain, hire new people. So it's um, it's not all uh, gloomy news out there. And equally, talking to some of the consultants working with the, the folks involved in the downsizing and exit at Honda, we have a lot of people who work in Honda Swindon who actually commute from Gloucestershire, who have got world-class training behind them and would add so much value to the engineering sector within the, within the county and clearly with the green economy you've got a lot of engineering software engineering businesses moving into the markets like electric vehicle component supply medical device development pharmaceutical mm -hmm. so there's a lot of upsides to uh, what we're seeing at the moment clearly there's going to be a requirement for incremental funding to drive apprenticeships at the university in Gloucester about 20 percent of the revenues around apprenticeships currently that's going to continue to grow but you know bays uh, uh, in, in the centre in London will be providing the LEPs right across the country, but certainly G First, a lot of tactical support. I'd like to see more uh, investment, more grants related to job creation, either on a part-time or full-time basis moving forward, particularly in relationship to apprenticeships. But I think for, for the young talent within the, uh, the county, there is a, a very opportunity a good opportunity strong opportunity for growth and you know environmentally it's a great place to live culturally i think what's interesting for companies when they if you look globally at people like apple and google and see how they treat their employees and have that flexible lifestyle working model you know clearly you can't always deliver that in a manufacturing scenario but nevertheless i think employers are going to have to rethink culturally how they operate and how they make their businesses attractive to young people because they have lots of choices and they want to work in their own uh, lifestyle rather than try and be shoeholed into maybe a, a model that was fit for purpose 30 years ago. But life moves on and, and clearly we've got to be aware of the needs of the, uh, of the next generation of talent coming into the marketplace. Absolutely, Peter. And I, I, I think this, uh, you know, the, the, the crisis that we're living through at the moment is, uh, you know, has... Um, given an opportunity to, you know, to actually kickstart that, where, whereas that change may may have been resisted greatly, um, you know, had we not had this. Um, so, uh, so, so yes, I'm I'm also feeling optimistic about what it what what is um, what those opportunities may be. 
Um, I'm just, what I'm going to do now is, um, I, I, having heard, um, heard from all of the panelists, I'm just going to pause um, and see if, um, if Jill has any questions from the audience um, so a, so to, couple, to pose. There's a couple come in, Jill. Um, one from um, Sue Gilding. Does the panel think the current changes we're seeing, such as more online shopping, delivery and distribution roles, as well as buying local, will continue and we'll gradually get back to where we were before? Also, how do you see the shorter and long-term job opportunities within the hospitality interest industry, which is clearly very important to Gloucestershire? Uh, absolutely. Um, thank you, Sue. Um, great question. Uh, who would like to take that particular question? Is uh, any anybody, Pete? Have you have you got any um, any thoughts on the sort of the, the the retail hospitality sectors with people that you've been working with, or anybody else on the panel that has? We've worked closely with um, regional, local regional uh, retailers uh, such as um, Mid Counties Co-op. They've been really supportive, working with local uh, artisan brands and giving them, uh, you know, some great sightings in store. They're sourcing locally. They see the advantage of a, you know, a very tight supply chain, local development, great exposure. It's it's all about being an ethical community-based retailer, um, and also obviously we've had. Some some of those development discussions with the food service businesses they've had to adapt short term and, and, and create a direct consumer model uh, but nevertheless I think there's some significant opportunities there interestingly despite everybody shopping online for, for groceries you know when you look at the overall market data online shopping in the food sector is still probably less than 10 percent of the total marketplace so it identifies still as great opportunities for farm shops independence and i think that's the big win is that if, if everybody's loyal i live in a rural uh, location where everybody is spending an awful lot of money in the local um, lottery funded uh, village shops and and i think if it's if it's you know, giving the independence an opportunity to regain some market share, maybe it will balance out. And obviously, as non-food retail comes back on stream next week, it'll be very interesting to see how comfortable people are, feel about this whole new shopping experience, because clearly the landscape's changing. So this, this sort of relaunch glide path that we're going to be looking at for businesses is going to be uh, in a very different place. And also, I think we've all, as consumers, you know, have this Amazon mentality when it comes to fulfillment. You know, same day, next day service is, is a given now. It's not a USP. So everybody's going to have to raise the bar in terms of their service levels. And, um, and as far as hospitality is concerned, clearly there has to be uh, a lot of support, financial support to protect, you know, an industry which, whether it's hotels, event management or, or um, field-based activity, there's going to have to be a lot of support around hospitality to ease them back into, into a trading position because clearly it's it's a tough a very tough uh, marketplace for them at the moment and and again i think it's market research will be very invaluable just to see what people's attitudes are to going away traveling staying in accommodation do you want to be fine dining in a restaurant with a waitress and waiters serving you with all the ppe protection in place eating our our, our meals behind plastic screens you know it's um it's 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 a tough one and, and i think it's that's why i see it as very much a sort of a, a long haul recovery um and that's where the direct delivery you know obviously the delivery type marketplace food to go marketplace is probably one of the key growth sectors both for hospitality vendors and maybe traditional bricks and mortar food retailers thank you peter has uh, has anybody got any um yes i've, I've got some um... Hands, to, hands up everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hands up everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so just want to come in, and, and I think I agree with Peter that it's, um, I, I think it's, it's, there's possibly, it's a long term change that possibly might um, come, certainly on the, um, on the e commerce side of things. I think there are businesses that haven't tried e commerce before who are now going online and marketing themselves, whether it's, um, Restaurants who are using uh, Facebook to generate takeaway orders. Um, my local pub has uh, created, um, after shutting down for a long time, they've come up and they're doing off sales of, of beer in plastic cartons. They're, they're doing um, 
ploughmans and they're looking at doing fish and chips and Sunday roasts that they're also promoting online. And there's lots of examples of businesses like that who are being innovative, not just in the hospitality side, but, but across. Um, and I think that um, that sort of thing will catch on and will carry on. Businesses that were traditionally just bricks and mortar are realizing the benefits of going online and their consumers, their customers are realizing that they could have some of the benefits of their local pub, their local restaurant, but at home with, and, and I think with the potential fear for some people of going into that um, closed environment, that will carry on. And I think the longer that carries on, the more um, normal it will become. I hate to use the word normal with the whole new normal thing going around, but the more normal it will become for uh, businesses to be online as well as bricks and mortar. And I'm certainly seeing um, there's, there's a lot of people who are setting up in their own businesses now, and most of those businesses are e-commerce. They, they're focused on because they can't go out and see people. It's all being done online. And there's numerous web development companies that, that I've spoken to that are seeing that they're having the busiest time in years at the moment through companies coming to them and saying, we need to get online. So I think e-commerce is growing. And I think over a long period, that will carry on. Um, certainly with hospitality, if they keep the innovation, that will, I think, help get some of them through. The tough times i was listening to um uh, so, some statistics this morning that said from um the uh, hospitality industry they said if we're particularly for pubs if we're at a two meter distancing rule and they opened up they'd have about 30 percent of revenue if we went to the one meter distancing rule they'd have about 70 percent of revenue so that could make a key difference as well for uh, the hospitality sector is how the government whether the government changes on that you know that distancing rule and how quickly then that will enable the hospitality sector to reopen um and then it comes down to whether people are going to be confident at one meter or not to go into them so i think a lot of unknowns but i think a lot of possibilities as well thank you thank you very much um i'd say i'd you'd just like to um, return a little bit um, to, to to what Peter had to say about the uh, you know about the sort of the the, the, the local um, the local food and and mm. how some of the uh, some of the smaller um, pubs and shops have been incredibly creative and resilient uh, and uh, and it's driven customers you know back to their back to their local shops which um, which may you know may be a very good thing. Um, so, you know, going back to skills and what sort, what sort of skills are important, the, the ability to reinvent yourself, to be able to come up with new ideas and follow them through and, you know, the bravery to, to, to do that um, are, are the, kind of, uh, the kind of skills that people need to be able to see through all these different things. Uh, and we've certainly seen some tremendous um, examples of that over the last few months. Has anybody else got anything to add to that question or um, can we have another question from Jill? If I may, um, Jill, yes, in do. terms of um, creativity and innovation in this space, I think that's what's going to be key. Um, one of the things that will come out of this um, environment that we've had pre-COVID and certainly post-COVID, and there's been some talk about it already in terms of um, engineering sector, the supply chain construction uh, as a result of this will see long-term fundamental reform, I, I believe. Um, sustainability and climate, you know, we don't hear much from Greta these days, but an awful lot of what she was asking for is, is one way or another beginning to happen. Um, so, you know, from a sustainability point of view, food miles will become more important for a range of different reasons. Um, I think where creativity and innovation will have to come into is that can't become an affluent choice. That's got to be an everybody's choice. Um, I think tariffs are going to play a, a function in that. I think there's going to be more celebration of things local. Um, you know, for good reasons or bad reasons or defensive reasons or positive reasons, but local will become more important. I, I think the key thing, whether you're in hospitality, food, or any of these things, it's going to be about customer experience. 
um, there's there's quite a lot of vanilla um, uh, selling points for, for for these things, and ultimately, you know, same day, next day delivery uh, is becoming ubiquitous. And actually, not always the most important customer experience uh, to to have. So I think those that innovate around the customer experience, that think about, um, you know, those that are coming out of this situation are going to want to be social. They're going to want to have um, more personal service. You know, they're not, you know, stay at home culture is something that will get rebelled against at some point because people will get tired of it. So I think um, there's an amount of repurposing that people need to think about. I think there's an element of, real laser beam focus on customer experience and listening to your customers. Um, not what they want, but what they need. Because as we've discussed earlier, it's not always easy to articulate what you need. Um, and then I think the other thing, back to Steve's final point on um, the one meter, two meter thing, you can put whatever rules you want in place. There's no debate in fluid dynamics. So, you know, people are going to have to be sensible about how they interact with that, whether they choose somebody else to decide their risk profile or whether they're smart enough to educate themselves as to how to mitigate um, what at the end of the day is a life-threatening um, uh, pandemic. Thank you, thank you JP. Sue, does that go some way to answering your question? Yes, thank you, Jill. Um, yeah, I, I was interested to hear the comments about local as well. I think it's just like consumer behaviour. It would be interesting to see <clears> if it's been long, long enough for it to be sort of ingrained and will stay or whether people, how much people will revert back to previous behaviour. So time will tell, hey? Yeah, ab absolutely. Absolutely. Jill, um, thank you like very much. Simon's wanting to... Simon. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. It was really just, I think, just to focus on those two questions. I mean, I, I think... I think people's habits will change for the long time, uh, you know, in the long term, sorry. Um, you know, whilst, you know, the COVID thing has been horrendous for those people who've had to, you know, experience it firsthand. Again, maybe I'm a bit sort of glass half full, but I, I think actually, you know, whether it was COVID or whether it was something else, I think this, this event that has made us change the way we live our lives, I think will actually in the long term be a very positive thing because... I think it does change your local habits. It does make you think about whether you need to get into a car. It does, you know, it does make you think about what's available local. So I think from an environmental perspective, uh, from a local business perspective, uh, I think, you know, being in this county, I think has a lot of positives. And I, and I do think, you know, because, you know, as we've heard already, people have adapted. I've got, I've got clients in the hospitality industry, which is the specific sector we're looking at. Uh, when we sat down at the beginning of this crisis, I think we were anticipating maybe a 10% drop off in our in our you know fees from from because we we're quite heavily invested in in clients in that sector. I would have to say almost without exception, they're they're all battling on, they're all adapting, and I think they'll all be reopening in one form or another if they're not already operating. You know, I've got a I've got a wine distributor who who exclusively delivered into into the, the hospitality trade. They've just changed their business model and they're doing home deliveries and they're now actually doing better than they were when they were delivering into hospitality. Again, servicing the change in people's own, you know, shopping habits. You know, we're all drinking maybe a little bit more at home. So, but, but that's the point. Everyone's adapting. And I think as long as you're not sitting on your hands waiting for, you know, for it all to get better, you know, you're actually, you know, changing the way you do, you know, you live your life and, and how you run a business. And, uh, and I just think, you know, Actually, there's a lot of opportunity at the moment, and I think you've just got to you've just got to look at that. And 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 I think as well, I think virtually everyone said, you know, adapt. I I, I have I have to say the experience I've had in the education sector, and I've been working with um, you know major universities, um, you know, up and down the country, and uh, and you know you would never have anticipated the you know the the ability for um, for universities to change the way that they do things. And to change it as rapidly as they have, um, because uh, because they are not renowned for for rapid change um, and rapid decision making. But I can assure you that it has happened, and it and it's certainly one of the things that 
that they would recognize as, as beneficial of, uh, of coming out of this. Um, that the, you know, the, the ability to take decisions and to move things forward fast has occurred. And I have to say, I would never have anticipated it. It, it used to be a, a 50 committees and, uh, and eight months to make a small decision job. It's, it's happening in the space of a week now. Um, Jill. So we have one other question um, from Kat Llewellyn, um, on a slightly different subject is, um, finding limited apprenticeships due to COVID-19 in a year where students have ruled out university, what advice does the panel have for them? Okay, I think, I think there's some, a couple of people would be really well equipped to answer that. Um, but I, 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 will, um, I will just start off as I have got um, a little bit of data from the Institute of Student Employers and, uh, and the, the figures that have come out recently as a, as a result of COVID-19 um, is that the, uh, the number of people going into apprenticeships is, is a little down um, you know, compared to, to how we were anticipating, um, more so than ordinary graduate, um, graduate jobs. But, um, but what they are saying is that those have, who have already been offered apprenticeships are holding up and that, and that they are being honoured at this stage. So um, that's just a little bit of data to support. Um, but uh, Simon and I think Lindsay have got experience of apprenticeships and working with apprentices. I, I just wondered whether you've got something to add to this question. Yeah, I mean, if, if I may start, if that's okay. Yeah. I mean, just... I mean, mine's yeah, obviously a bit niche because we're looking at the accountancy sector, but um, certainly via Whitehorse Training, um, who I'm involved with, we've certainly seen um, a, a much more um, uh, nervousness of, of people putting, of taking on uh, apprentices at the moment. So I think we're going to see our apprentice numbers coming on in September much, much lower than we would, we would have seen ordinarily. Uh, which in some respects is a is a, a shame because as you've already said i mean a lot of education providers are adapting you know we're we're being able to deliver all of our training online so you know it's not that the training is going to be lacking i think it is there is just that little bit of nervousness of of what you know what the you know what the climate's going to look like um you know if, if i was being brave and trying to predict i think i think yes it's going to be really tough for the youngsters trying to get onto apprenticeship schemes for the next six to nine months but I fear then we'll, we'll walk into that sort of familiar territory of suddenly there being skill shortages within, within employers and they're then frantically trying to recruit people and also that we'll also have a bit of a gap in, in sort of young fresh talent coming through because there will be this period where nobody's taking on as many apprenticeships as, you know, apprentices as perhaps they should be. But I think that's human nature, and I, and I you know, I, I think I, I feel sorry for the youngsters coming out of school who are applying at the moment. I think you know they're going to have to be prepared for quite a few, you know, rejections. But I mean, I had one the other day, and I just, I just said to the individual, you know, don't, don't be despondent. You know, we, we're not taking on someone in anyone in September, but you know, you know, it's a, you've still got a good CV. Just, just stick with it because you know, I think six to nine months time, we could be looking at a very different picture as. As, as people realise that we have actually adapted and, and that maybe the media predictions are not quite as doom and gloomy as, as, as you know, they have us all believe. So I think you've just got to remain positive and, and just persevere. Um, it might be you have to go and do something for a while that isn't your ideal career choice until, you know, suitable opportunities come up would, would be my view. But as I say, that is perhaps looking from a narrow perspective of accountancy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. And uh, and I think, you know, again, one of the messages that are coming out from uh, um, from the sort of the, the, the wider um, the wider perspective is that employers you know, often are um, employing young people on attributes and not, you know, specific subjects. And I'm, I know Lindsay will have something to say on this. Um, and, and certainly, you know, there are areas that are that are in need where there are skills shortages, particularly in digital skills in uh, you know in cyber skills and uh, and some of these key areas that are still in growth whereas there are you know other areas of the economy that are are challenged right now so you know finding the right areas to consider um, there may not be the same sort of um, the, the same sort of challenges in all and so i'd just like to bring lindsay in to maybe have a view on that question yes 
Thank you. Um, and um, sort of linking in with what you have both said, Simon and, and, and Jill as well. Um, certainly I agree in the sense of it's it got to be realistic, it is going to be challenging and certainly in the short term, um, next sort of six months or so. And um, it, But for each, each young person, it's uh, it kind of comes back to one of the things that I um, feel about kind of how all of us go forward in the workplace um, in the 21st century is um, that the, um, the, the it sits with the, the someone's progress sits with the individual not with the employer mm -hmm. someone each, each of our careers belongs to us and jobs belong to employers but our career belongs to us so sort of starting from a, a point of, of, of kind of feeling this is a challenging time but the way to be positive about it is to kind of take charge and take responsibility for what you can do and a lot of those things are around the resilience and the flexibility that we've talked about um, quite a lot so far in terms of both businesses, individuals, industries. Um, and in terms of the individual, the flexibility around maybe not being able to go into exactly what you ideally would have wanted to go into straight away, but to use that experience positively to be aware of all the things you're learning all the skills you're using that you can transfer into different scenarios and to be very alert to keeping a record of you know when you've done something that's gone well um, you know having a specific example of how you've used a skill that's all those are all tools in your employability kit and so I would really encourage young people to see you know themselves they're, they're the I mean I think someone earlier said you know that in any company the people are the real treasure and I think that it's about thinking you know I am I have something individual that no one else has to offer and if I'm self-aware around my employability skills how I can develop my skills and how I can speak and write confidently about them I'm putting myself in the best position I possibly can in this situation and so I certainly feel it's um it is a challenge but it is also an opportunity to think you know maybe for some of us and certainly i would say myself i in my early career i wouldn't have seen myself as being able to be in the driving seat of my own you know my own destiny and i wish i'd done that earlier um, i trained as a career advisor when i was 30 and um it, that was a turning point for me um, but for young people now if they have this experience early on then really you know they can be the source of their career and their employability and um, going forward and be ready for the the you know the the, the um, be ready for what comes but be ready when the opportunities are there thank you thank you very much Lindsay Kat does that answer your question Yes, thanks very much. Really helpful. In fact, all the conversation has been really useful. So thank you. Great. No, thank you very much for that. Um, I'd like to just move on to an another area that I think well, um, yeah. uh, I think would. Um, yeah, JP wanted to say something. Yeah, go JP. So I'm not Sorry. I'm not getting I'm not getting the hand the hands up that are on on my screen here. So uh, so I'm no, missing I'm, I'm one. Afraid, um, I'm going I'm going old school. <laughs> OK, <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> um, very quickly, um, I think there's a long term and a short term piece for youth. And I think, you know, we've put a lot of emphasis on youth and training and skills, but actually, I think this topic applies to all ages. Uh, mm. The development of people at all ends of the scale are going to be critical. It's very um, readily understandable to talk about the youth. Uh, and young adults, but actually what we say about them is actually also true um, for people at all ages of their career, in, including those at the late stages of their career, mm -hmm. or what would traditionally have been late stages in their career. I think one of the things that's going to happen as a result of this is there's going to be a big uh, acceleration on automation of routine uh, tasks. An awful lot of what we get trained for, a lot of what we've emphasized STEM for, etc. Uh, you know, 
whether it be in a, even in accountancy or legal, there's a lot of routine activity that will be automated um, that actually just needs to be done very carefully with very little variability and a high degree of um, uh, repetitive consistency, which took a lot of skill in the past. But there are algorithms and machine learnings, and I'm sure you've all seen plenty of examples of it, where even um, you know, court judgments or you know, conveyancing or whatever you look at, there's going to be a lot of routine activity that's going to get automated. So, you know, you could look at that and say that's really dismal um, prospect for young people, but actually I think it's really exciting. Those are pretty mind-numbing jobs. Um, we talk about hard skills and soft skills, but actually soft skills are the hard skills of the future. And Very much. Um, your ability to sort of collaborate and your ability to demonstrate your ability to collaborate, your ability to demonstrate creativity, um, your ability to articulate um, is going to be way more important uh, going forward than it has been in the past. So um, the robots are coming, but they're coming for boring jobs um, in the first instance at least. So my advice to young people would, would be to um, spend time demonstrating that you're good at working together with other people. Do some good. And, and people will, uh, will want that in their workplace. Um, you know, you can certainly uh, develop hard skills. It's not a bad thing. I'm not saying don't do that. But what I am saying is that um, uh, in, order to, in order to move forward, Jill mentioned that, you know, organizations are hiring on attributes. And, and I think really, I'll summarize by saying, um, in the future, we need to be more human, not more machine. Yeah, I would, I, I would, I would say so. I mean, I, I've been uh, been working and discussing with employers for many years now, and uh, and time after time, it is the it is the the, the, the softer skills um, that that are actually. Um, what they're really after in employees, whether you know whether that is a young person or later down the line, because the you know the, the harder task-based things can you know can be taught. The, um, the the sort of attitudinal things are the ones that really make um, you know that that in, that employee really valuable, um, because because they are you know they are adaptive, they are flexible, they are resilient, they're all of those things, um, and uh, and you know employers are needing people to be able to turn their hand to more than one thing now um, and uh, and somebody who one has the ability to do that but secondly the attitude to be happy to do that is uh, you know it is something that's really valuable to an employer uh, and uh, and this is heightened that but it um, it has been the topic of conversation that I've had with employers for for a number of years now um, and I, I think just leading on from that, because I think it leads on very well from that, was uh, was coming to the point that uh, that, that I wanted um, the panel to discuss a little more. Was you know we we've talked about the sort of change in working environments and that people have um, and employers have been more open to the idea of uh, of employees working from home um, and being more flexible. Um, it has you know that that change has come more quickly because of this situation. But you know, I mean, if that is embraced and doesn't uh, and doesn't revert to what we um, had ha had known as the traditional norms, then um, you know, what sort of um, what sort of changes do might that need for the skill set of the people that are working in that way, but also for those that are leading and managing people that are working in that way. Um, because it is it is different. It's different than having people coming nine to five and being, um, to want a better word, supervised on the job from day, you know morning to leave. Um, so you know it means trust. It means people working in a more outcomes based way. Um, and um, or it means as a conversation I was having yesterday, I think with with, with Peter, um, sort of artificial tech that's coming in to monitor people in their home place. So, which, you know, which way does it go? What are the, what are the benefits of those? And, uh, and what do the panel think of that kind of, uh, that kind of skills need going forward? Who, who would like to start? Simon, Simon has a view on that. 
Yeah, um, well, mainly because I think we we went into this with probably differing views within our own organisation of what remote working would be like and, and, and whether it would work for us. Um, I think we were nervous of it. Um, um, not the technology, but just just the fact that we were, you know, we've got 20 employees and, you know, to have them all working from home with minimal supervision, you know, is, is a, you know, probably a scary prospect when you've had them all working under one roof historically. Um, and we've been astounded by how well it's worked. I mean, if anything, I, I mean, you know, I was saying earlier to, to, to Joe when we had a sort of discussion beforehand, you know, if anything, our, our productivity is probably ahead of where it was last year. In terms of getting getting information out to clients, in terms of tax returns and accounts, etc., and and I'm sitting here now thinking, well, why am I asking a member of staff to drive in from Tewkesbury every day? Uh, you know, so you know, and you know, when they've got young families, you know, surely for for them, they're going to be more motivated if they can if they can work from home. They've got the flexibility, more flexibility. So I think moving forward, um, you know, I think certainly as a as a you know a local employer, will definitely be you know, perhaps sticking with this as a working practice. Yeah, I, I, I think it is important that we have people in, in the office um, uh, from time to time because I think, you know, the, the team camaraderie of getting together is, is, is important, especially in our business. We're a people business at the end of the day. But, but, I, think, but I think there'll be a happy medium. And I, and I think we'll go some way to a sort of halfway house where we, we have people perhaps coming in on it for maybe a, a team meeting every now and again. But, but I see it's continuing, and, and I think a lot of businesses are like that. I think a lot of businesses have been surprised at how well it has worked. And, um, and I think it, it has so many positives, you know, taking strain off the transport system, as I say, look, just removing a lot of dead time in the day, you know, driving in in a car or on public transport, it's not a good use of time. So uh, I'm, I'm very supportive of it, and I think it's a positive, one of the positives coming out of this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've got some hands up now that I can that I can see. Steve, can I uh, can I turn to you? Yeah. Thanks, Jill. I'll, I'll I'll try and keep it brief. I'm aware time's time's getting on. Um, but yes, yeah, so I, I, I've got clients who, like Simon, have had that experience. They didn't think that remote working was going to work for them, and they've discovered that absolutely it has. Um, and I think, as you say, if you show faith in your your staff, that can be repaid. I think the caveats there is, is you need to have the right management structure. A micromanager cannot manage remote workers very well. You need to have somebody who allows people to get on and, as you say, is focused on delivery. So it's about the management style has to be right to enable that. But I think also companies have to be aware, um, and staff as well, is that although, yes, it's great for the work-life balance to be working from home and it's great for the environment, some people do not have that space to work from home in. So, you know, and it's not suitable for them. So I think employers um, have to be aware that they still need to potentially provide the space for employees to come into the office. They can't just get rid of the office structure completely. And staff have to also be honest about can they actually do their job working from home or is the home environment just not conducive for that and then that might move into you know people working out of um, shared working spaces instead of from home and companies paying you know contributing towards the cost of getting a membership of you know a growth hub or, or somewhere like that that the staff can work out of potentially even having you know teams of staff working out of a growth hub uh, of that sort. So I think there's um, there's, there's a, a few things to be thought about rather than just assuming, I think, as some companies that I know that they think they can all just get rid of all our, our offices, chuck everybody to working from home, we'll save a fortune and everybody's going to be brilliant, which is the complete opposite of before when they said there's no way anybody can work outside <laughs> of the office. So um, I think this is sense either way. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm going to bring everybody um, um, briefly in on this question because I know everyone has, uh, has, has something to say. Um, JP, I know you've had your hand up as well on this because this is a this is something very close to your heart. Well, as as somebody who's been running remote teams since two thousand and five, um, some of the realizations that people are having over the last three months, um, I've been in the fortunate position of realizing that you know um, fifteen years ago, 
which sounds very big headed, but um, it, it was the reality of running a, a global business that needed people to deploy locally. So I couldn't be with everybody all of the time and I couldn't see them as frequently as um, let's, let's call it management practice or supervisory practice would require. This is about leadership. And the 21st century is about leadership. It's about influence power rather than position power. It is about hiring the right people for the right reasons. Um, it's about being very clear on what your culture of your organization is about and um, ensuring that you have uh, mechanisms that let you identify whether you've hired correctly or, or not to meet that culture. Um, I often call it um, unlocking the horsepower within your organization, and I think that's where productivity lies. And one of the reasons the UK is such a big issue with productivity is I think people are managed to death, and they're not given the opportunity to be creative, and they're not given the trust to go about their job in a smarter way. So you've got people who don't really know the realities of doing a job at a detail level, telling people at a micro level how it should be done. And, and, and that's just inefficient and it puts people under stress. It impacts on well-being. So, so my, my view on this is that there's no putting this genie back in the bottle. The organizations that try to are living in the 20th century. They're not living in the 21st century. The organizations that view this as being um, an area where you need to have a high degree of police control over what your people are spending your time on when we get back to the war for talent they'll be off like a shot you, so you know you treat people like idiots they'll behave like idiots mcgregor's x and y theory one of the fundamental management theories from early days so this stuff's known but it's about trust and it's about competent hiring and it's about treating your people with respect so for, for me, the genie's not going back in the bottle. Organizations have to decide, do they accept that and embrace it, or are they going to reel against it? If you reel against it, your days are numbered. Thank you. Thank you very much. I knew that would be an impassioned, uh, <laughs> impa impassioned uh, uh, sort of pitch on that one, because it's uh, very important. Um, Peter, before I just go to um, before I go to Lindsay, I'm going to bring you in because I'm I'm going to ask um, Lindsay this question from a slightly different angle. So uh, so Peter, are you uh, are you able to share your views on this? Well, I think I agree with JP. I think it's all about trust and, and, and giving the people the freedom to develop. If you've got the right uh, the right team, they're going to deliver. And I was looking at some research from a from a, 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 a partner in a different marketplace entirely, and they've done some research on this home working. And it was fascinating to see where people were actually working even longer days at home you know so there's that sort of balance that lifestyle balance thing there's this temptation still to be at the laptop at seven o'clock at night if you're not careful and um you know they were just talking about how how they um, protect employees uh, uh, at a distance but he but equally the um the interesting the interesting uh article from the, the new york times journalist who wrote who was road testing this uh, software in the states was saying you know he was he was pretty anti halfway through clearly the employment legislation in europe is very different from the united states and i think um you know the uh, the legal uh, hr specialists i'm sure would would have to look very closely at how um, people's working days are being monitored through software um, and you know, again, I think a bit of common sense and 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 um, it should need to, would need to be applied. But I think it's beneficial. You know, clearly everybody recognises the lifestyle and commercial benefits all around from the remote working. Nevertheless, clearly that's where the growth hubs could capitalise on the hub working. And already I've had a number of calls in recent weeks asking from from uh, contacts looking to have a a face-to-face -face board meeting you know but just hire a room for th for an hour and and it's uh, you know there are certain confidential things that do need to be discussed uh, on, a, on a on a team basis but i think clearly people are gonna 
certainly remodel their, their working lifestyle. Um, and as from somebody who does far too much driving uh, and not enough time uh, in front of the camera these in recent uh, years, I'd be delighted that you know everybody adopts this. But I just think I think there's going to be a balance, and clearly, from an employment legislation point of view, I think that people are going to have to have a long, hard look at how they safeguard everybody's interests. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I say, um, Lindsay, I've, I've left you your answer to last on this one because um, something I was thinking from a careers point of view and particularly sort of bringing people into new jobs is, uh, you know, if they're coming into a new job where they're not actually going into a workplace to meet people, um, how equipped um, are young people or even returning people um, to be able, you know, in, from a confidence point of view, to be able to navigate that? I think that's um, that is a, um, a really, really good question, and um, a, a, the son of a friend of mine has experienced exactly that. Um, he moved from Lincolnshire to Manchester a week before lockdown. He didn't know the city. He is 21. Uh, moved into a flat and started had a week at his job, and then went into lockdown. So he has been in a new job in lockdown for the past three months. Um, so experiencing exactly that. I think, you know, he was fortunate in that he had that week and he had met people. Um, but um, I think um, the, the confidence um, issue is a big one because it feels different. Certainly it's very different. Um, in trying to get settled in if you're not in a physical environment and, and if you are just sort of able to see and speak to people online. Um, I think the things there, I guess I'd be maybe talking through with young people or anyone perhaps who's going into that situation would be about um, the experiences they have had in an online way in the last three months because I think as I was saying earlier on one of the positives maybe that people can reflect on is how they've adapted in the last three months and how they are you you know have used um, technology in different ways and have become more used to to, to reflect on that to kind of that to be a sort of starting point for thinking positively about it but also to think about being proactive in using and learning from your all your experiences and actually reflecting on them it sounds maybe like maybe quite a small thing but so many of us adults and young people don't reflect and don't take time to reflect on what they've learned and how they dealt with something and how they could deal with it better and certainly some of the questions that i have or had to ask myself when I had a rethink was very much about, gosh, I don't think I took the time to reflect. And I think this has been a time when perhaps people can get used to doing that on a regular basis because that's the way to be continued the learning journey for themselves and self-development. So that's one thing. And the other thing I think is about literacy, sort of technology literacy and sort of being good at recognising the value in the currency and the reliability of online resources and being prepared to be a self-guided learner um, online, but also being um, the skill of using IT to tell your story and to inspire other people. So it's about how you use the technology for you know to to be you know to put yourself across how you use it in that way in working with other people um and i think that so a lot of the skills we've been talking about throughout this morning uh, about flexibility and resilience and um you know being open to new and different ways of working so i i guess that's that would be my kind of approach on that Thank you very much, Lindsay. I think uh, I think we've heard we've heard a lot of great things this morning um, about the you know the, the sectors what um, what sectors are are expanding in the county where the opportunities may lie where where the changes to working practices um, may create opportunities but but also about the kind of skills that may be needed alongside the sort of technical skills or the soft skills to be able to navigate new ways of um, ways of working around how we 
at how leadership works um, you know, in that for, for organizations. So uh, I think a lot of food for thought and I'd like to very much thank all of the panelists for their contributions. Uh, and just before we close, I'd, I'd just like to ask Jill, are there any, any further questions from the audience that we, um, that we can address before we finish today? Um, no, I think we've answered all the ones that came in, so. Okay. Well, just leaves me to thank everybody very much indeed. It's been a really interesting discussion this morning and, uh, uh, and I hope everybody continues to uh, take the positives out of this, uh, this lockdown situation and that we, you know, we, we go on to do great things in Gloucestershire. Great. Thanks everyone. Brilliant. Thank, thank, you. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. It's been really thank interesting and great to hear from everybody. I found it a really interesting and inspiring hour. So thank you.